uh, on Facebook. Hello to all of you. Um, I'm Bahamian Pinder, um, but I am very fortunate in that I have been able to lead a professional life of doing global consulting work really focused on this space of being able to collect new primary data, analyze it, and then give largely governments, national institutions, sometimes international UN agencies recommendations that are really evidence-based. So that's sort of the space that, that I like to live in is collecting new data and transforming it into ways to actually make a social transformation, but that is evidence-based. So that that's me uh, in a nutshell, I'd say. And a little bit about Sandy Jest. So Sandy Jest is a teeny little, we're very small uh, woman, me, <laughs> woman-owned, um, woman-led organization where we do projects. We've done hundreds of projects globally have done quite a bit of work in the Bahamas, um, my home base, as well as regionally. We do a lot of work in healthcare. We do a lot of work in early childhood education and in any areas related to equity. Um, so whether it's increasing equity in access to healthcare, increasing equity in access to early childhood education or increasing access to basic human rights and dignity. So a lot of the work we've been doing recently has been gender focused, um, ranging from interesting things like what are the barriers to women in small island developing states getting into a really growing industry like alternative energy? Why are women being left behind in this area to the data gap divide, but also in the area of gender-based violence, uh, violence against women and girls. Um, so, but that's our main thing. We love getting data, transforming it, and hopefully making an impact in people's lives uh, based on it. And you you mentioned both in your kind of introduction to yourself and Sunny Jess, this importance of giving data that allows people, organizations, institutions to develop whatever needs to be developed in an evidence-based way. Do you find that this is something that clients or because sometimes the client isn't the like end user, is this something that the client and or and or the end user actually wants in most cases or are they kind of checking a box or is this something that you're actively encouraging them to do? Super question. And I'd say it's honestly, it's, it's a, it's a mix, right? Even when we talk about institutions, institutions are made up of people. And I will almost always find that there is somebody that is just as big a data dork as I am and are really excited. They're like, look, there's this project. They want to spend millions of dollars on it but they're not doing it based on, on anything that's actually contextualized for the country in which it is. Can you help us? Like, what can we do to make sure that we're gonna be spending these resources in the most efficient and most effective way? That being said, there's definitely box ticking. Um, so a lot of the work that I do is with UN agencies, whether it's UN Women, UN AIDS, WHO, there's UNICEF, um, all of the, the wonderful groups out there, but most countries have signed on to some sort of convention, some sort of something that requires them to submit a report, oftentimes maybe a little too frequently, um, especially in small island developing states where our populations are tiny and we keep on going back to the same people to collect the same data, um, but they need to submit some report. And so they're like, hey, go get this data just so that we can do this. I generally don't like to be a part of those types of projects, but they definitely go on throughout the world. Yeah, for sure. And with the WHS, how did that come to be? How did, how did, how was it decided this is an important survey? We need to look at domestic violence and intimate partner violence in the Bahamas, be able to measure it and like who, who came up with this idea and why? So that, I mean, I think this gets into the, the whole origin story of this, which is maybe where I should have started, apologies. But so yeah, the, the region, 
And I do mean the whole region, uh, well, at least all the Carib countries, the English speaking Caribbean countries, we were behind the eight ball. Um, to be honest, we still are behind the eight ball when it comes to knowing what is happening to our women and girls. Um, so prior to 2015, there were no national prevalence studies done in the region. And it was really this both international agency and local governments and regional bodies coming together. So UN Women, the Inter-American Development Bank, CARICOM, all came together 2013, 2014-ish to discuss the fact that there just wasn't any data on gender-based violence in the region. Jamaica then jumped on board. They were the first country to really pilot what is a global tool. So this is a tool that was started by WHO, um, the World Health Organization, um, with lots of inputs from other stakeholders, and then is always contextualized um, both at the regional level typically and then at the country level. So Jamaica did it, then time went on, and uh, up until 2020, it had been Jamaica, Trinidad and Tobago, Suriname, Grenada, and Guyana had all completed their national prevalence studies. All some sort of version of this. And so, yeah, and the Bahamas stepped up uh, as the, the next one. There was an ongoing project with the Inter-American Development Bank here at the time as well called the Citizen Security Project. And as part of the citizen security project, the government was um, really focused on doing this and not just do what had been done in other countries, which was collect the data um, for a little bit of those box tickings, as you said, but also because they wanted to um, have a good background to create a comprehensive care model. And this type of model is called lots of different things in different places, but um, for those who in the audience, because I know Lisa already knows this very well, but for anybody out there who isn't aware, it's it's really just an awful situation. Um, what you're faced as a woman after you have been through violence of some type. So typically you're going to maybe go to a healthcare provider. And if they recommend then that you go to the police, then you're going to go tell the exact same story that you just told the healthcare provider. You're going to tell it to the, the first police person that you interact with. Quite often, you're going to have to say that same story a bunch of times to more individuals within the justice system, in the courts. If it's really at the level, it's domestic violence, you have an intimate partner situation and you have to move and now you need to go get a new job or you need some sort of financial assistance, you're probably going to have to tell your story to social services and to others that are trying to assist you financially. If your child needs to have a school transfer, it's just, it is the exact opposite of a one-stop shop. It's really difficult um, to, to tell your story that many times you've been traumatized already. And often women are re-traumatized during this process. Um, and the other thing with gender-based violence for those who are maybe fortunate enough not to have experienced is it is very rarely a one-off. I know that sort of that image out there is like of the one woman who, you know, is raped once. No, especially when you're dealing with intimate partner violence, this is just, it's an ongoing continual setup in the story that you led with, right? She'd reported that there was this violence going on that she was worried about what was going to happen. And our legal system just isn't set up for this, right? Like our legal system is set up for you get robbed. Your car got stolen, you know, this happened. It's like, it's a one-off thing is what most of our systems are set up for. And so what the Bahamas wants to do is use the data, not just the quantitative data that was collected during this process where we interviewed over a thousand Bahamian women who shared their stories, but we also did qualitative data collection. We had focus group discussions where women really shared their, their real deep intimate stories of what had occurred. And then we talked to the, the key informants. So these are social services, um, everybody within the, the legal system, our NGOs who are doing such an incredible job, are, um, you know, obviously individuals um, from the Bahamas Crisis Center, a whole range of individuals um, to really be able to piece together what is the Bahamas missing right now 
And how can we use these data points to, to use my dorky terms, triangulate what might be the best option for it? Where are these gaps? How can we fill them in? Um, so yeah, so that's where the Bahamas is unique. The other countries, that was not their goal. So we act, or that was not their initial goal. They have since used their data in interesting ways, but we came out from the beginning saying we wanted to do that. So I know this is what the government is going to be working with the, the IDB on, is this process of, of really coming up with a comprehensive care model. So the, the comprehensive care model then, also known as the coordinated care model, is a way of connecting these different institutions so they work as one system and ideally a survivor of gender-based violence would only tell their story once and that information would sort of be shared and they'd get referrals. Is that the idea? Yeah. So I'll, I'll give you sort of the WHO definition. So I'm actually going to read something off apologies, but a comprehensive care model is a system of networks, agreements, processes, and applied principles, and the principles are important, created by local crisis centers, shelters, criminal justice agencies, and human service programs that are going to create a CCM that centralize, centralizes and focuses the needs of survivors of gender-based violence against women and girls. A CCM, this comprehensive care model, aims to provide guidance to work together to ensure that a comprehensive survivor survivor response is provided to all survivors and their children. And it's really, it's got these four components and only because you just mentioned one of them. One of the four key things is that it enhances interagency relationships. So instead of having the right hand over here and the left hand over there and never shall they actually interact, this is really a, a mechanism to allow all of the individuals and folks who are working with the women's goals in mind, but they just don't know what's going on to have that. It's also one of the, the other four key components is raising awareness of what victim and survivor's rights are. You'll know this better than anybody is, again, but one of these key things is so many women just don't know what their rights are. That That is unfortunately what the reality is. We want to increase access to and improve service delivery. So also, you know, I'm from Eleuthera. So I'm well aware that just so much of what we talk about is always Nassau focused, Nassau based. So how do we ensure that issues that are going on in Cat Island or in Andros, that those women are going to be able to access care just as easily and efficiently as the woman who is here in Camp Road? Um, and if needed, and it often is, is we need to change institutions' policies and their practices, right? Because if we have a system that was set up in the 80s based on it was only these two groups out there, then that's not going to work in a digital age where there's social media, where things are being shared on WhatsApp that nobody wants to have shared on WhatsApp. Like, what are the things that need to change to protect women in, in all the ways? And you brought up Family Islands, which I find myself thinking about more and more and more and more. And it's a very difficult space to navigate, I think, for us. It's, it's one of the toughest things about being an archipelago is that everything is so centralized to Nassau. And the family islands, the communities are so small. People are all so interconnected. And I think we saw this demonstrated very well in a, in a horrible way when the, the the woman who accused the MP of rape flew to another island to make that report to the police. And the news story didn't say why, but we could all imagine why, why that might be. First of all, it's, a, it's an MP, right? Connections, but also small island, you don't know who's related to who, can you really talk to this police officer? Is it just gonna get back to the person? Are you going to experience more violence? So there are a lot of people on family islands who are not reporting, especially the small ones that maybe have one or two police officers, right? Or the tiny ones where they have somebody who's playing the role of police officer, immigration officer, <laughs> customs officer. So a coordinated or a comprehensive care model would have to take all of this into consideration. Looking at, at the Bahamas is a very unique situation with all of these islands, all of these transportation difficulties, um, difficulty in accessing resources. Do we have a shelter on every island? 
do we have a crisis center on every island? How how does all of that work? Did you see this coming out of the data and the development of the model? So on the quantitative side, um, it's more difficult just because we have such a small population. So while, and I mean, I can't get into all the nitty gritty bits of the results, but we did get data from across the family islands, but being again, because I'm such like a statistical person, to be able to say that we have statistically significant data that says that women in the family islands X, Y, Z from that level, it's very difficult. But from the qualitative data, and women were able to leave detailed comments after some of the questions. Um, and that is, I think, where it really came out when we're looking at maybe why women didn't report. So a lot of women don't report. That's just the harsh reality um, of it. And there are many reasons for it. Um, oftentimes it's not what we're thinking about or what the average person, I should say, think about. Oftentimes the woman doesn't report it because she loves the person, right? Like it's a very, it's it's amazing the number of times that the reason they gave, well, you know, I love him and he's the father of my children. And that comes out. But other reasons that, that did come out were definitely all the ones we can think about. There was examples of who they would be reporting to was related to the perpetrator, which we know the likelihood of that happening if we're in one of our smaller family islands with a population of less than a thousand. Um, it's just, unfortunately, the odds are, are not in your favor. Um, and it is. And then it also comes into, though, do do we want a shelter on every island? What what would that mean? What would that do it, in a, a practical, unfortunate sense? It's probably not very effective because, again, if you have the shelter on the island. Is a woman going to go there knowing that almost everybody is probably going to know she's going to go there? Or is a better option that there really are transportation options that we can make available? And this is what my hope and goal would be that what the government will be able to do with partners is really examine the data, both the qualitative and the quantitative to say, huh, you know what, actually, if we were able to do you know, the X number of charter flights that we would need or just getting tickets for people per year, that's actually going to be much cheaper than building centers in each island and staffing them and dealing with maintenance and all of the other things. So, I mean, it's just, it's a teeny example, but I would say that my hope is that lessons learned too from other countries like the Philippines. I know that they've um, dealt with similar issues um, with their archipelago too. A lot of our South Pacific um sister small island developing states as well, Tonga, Samoa, Tonga in particular, because their archipelago is also very expansive and even flights between the islands can be quite long. Um, so looking at what other countries are developing, I think will help us as well. This doesn't, while it has to be culturally and in contextually relevant for the Bahamas, we do not always have to reinvent the wheel. Yeah. And interesting that you brought up the, the population issue, the close-knit community as a reason to not go to a shelter, for everyone to know that, oh, this person has gone to a shelter, this person's with their, their children in a shelter. And it took me back to a conversation that we had during the Global 16 Days campaign, maybe 2022, maybe 2021, um, with Don Laval Harvard, who is based in Canada, and talked about the conversations that are taking place in Indigenous communities in Canada about not uprooting women and children who are victims to put them in shelters and instead putting the men in them and noting that shelters could be just as good at keeping the men in as they are at keeping the men out. So it's a really interesting way to, to flip it, it especially. Yeah. I didn't even think about the stigma that you you just oh. raised right about shelters. And I'd, I'd like to, so just also on the closeness of communities though, there is an interesting trend from the regional data Again, be interesting to, to see how it compares with what comes out in the Bahamas. But one of the trends that has been seen is that there is an inverse relationship. So in a in a good way. So the closer you feel to your community, you feel that you do have ties to your community and you've got a network of family that you see on a regular basis. 
there is a negative correlation with that and re reporting at least of gender-based violence. So if you think that you've got um, this network around you who's ready to support, you're less likely to, to report that you're also having violence. So, you know, in some of these communities, how can we also draw on that strength of having the, com the community being there to protect the women and girls within it? And I think, again, sometimes this is just about education and making people aware of 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 what all of our rights are and how we can help protect each other's rights. A lot of this is so counterintuitive. You know, we we make a lot of assumptions about gender-based violence, about what it means to be a victim, what it means to be a survivor, and what people want and what the solutions are. And this is another lesson that we learned in 2020 when we started developing recommendations to submit to the government on ending gender-based violence. And we had this conversation in these sort of three buckets, prevention, response, and justice. And when we got to the justice piece, because we made this a, a collaborative sort of working space where members of the public came and joined, and the general public was saying harsher penalties, longer time in jail, like this has to be what happens. And survivors themselves were saying, yeah, that's why we don't report. Exactly because it's not helpful for me to put my husband or my baby daddy or whoever in prison and then have to pay these school fees by myself. Exactly right there. And I mean, and we heard it here, you hear it globally, and it is so fascinating, right? This again and again, and the love, like love is there and the work that it can be done um, with male perpetrators, they're such interesting. And I am definitely not an expert on this, so I don't want to pretend like I know anything, but um, one of the women that worked with us on this project from, so we partnered with a group called Global Rights for Women. Um, and Melissa, my dog is here, everybody. Hello, I am so sorry. sorry, home-based, um, but Melissa does do a lot of this work with male perpetrators. And it's really interesting when, again, we talk so much about like the therapy for women and all of the work that can go on for the women, but just as importantly is that males need to be able to receive good actual professional services um, and sometimes that's just not what's going to happen in jail. So there's both punishment when obviously the horrendous things that we've talked about have occurred. Um, but there, there seems to be this spectrum of responses that the system um, could be having for male perpetrators. And I know there is some work being done here, but it seems like it's definitely a gap in the Bahamas and, and the region, not just the Bahamas. I mean, it's a gap globally. So I'm sure it's a gap here. I should say that. Yeah, and, and I want to be really clear that this is not caping for men. This is about the women and what is safe for them and ensuring that justice, like what we call justice, isn't an injustice to the survivor, that it isn't punishing the survivor as well. So we have to think about that. We have to think beyond our rage and our sadness about the the violence that they've experienced and also be able and willing and ready to center survivors in their own you know, path toward justice and healing. And healing has to be a big part of justice. Um, and doing that work with men is really important so that they don't reoffend. Because there's really no point to putting people in prison if you're just gonna let them back out in the same way that they went in or worse, right? Like people joke in the Bahamas that um, the prison is like a school, how to, how to become a, like a worse person and a better criminal. Um, so we have to be thinking outside of that, although prison might be a part of it, you know. Oh, and it 100% is in, in yeah. so many cases, but it, it still does. I mean, in healthcare, we talk a lot about patient-centric care, right? Which is the patient should always be the focus of every healthcare system. And are you providing the care that the patient actually wants it, you know so an easy example is so are you going to give a mammogram to a 94 year old woman like what's she going to do with the results of it? It, it is that something that she wants or needs in her life um and it's i think it's it's just so missing in this space of justice um for women who have survived 
violence against them. And again, I am also not just talking about, and I know you're not talking about, but we haven't really brought it up, but this is not just physical violence. So physical violence is a part of it. And it's the most talked about along with sexual violence. Those two are the two that are often talked about the beatings, the rapes, that, but emotional and financial um, violence are equally corrosive um, to women's life quality and a whole range of other things. So the regionally, this issue of financial violence, economic violence, where women are coerced into doing things that they don't want to, it doesn't have to be sexual. It can be whatever, just changing what they want to do because they don't have the financial empowerment um, and the their partner has more of that power. That comes out a lot, a lot, a lot. And then the psychological abuse. Um, and it's sort of as if psychological abuse is almost seen as this gateway drug, um, very similar to how people used to discuss certain like alcohol was the gateway to I don't know but some other um drug well that is really what is seen though with the psychological abuse so if you are constantly being berated if you are con constantly being undermined if you are being shouted at if all of these things are going on the chances of that then being able to progress unfortunately to physical violence is it once that pattern of abuse is established it it unfortunately can can escalate to the physical and the sexual and so also coming in is that maybe one of the areas too where for the victim's sake male perpetrators you know that you can actually say you know this male who is the father of my child who i don't want to go to prison because he is emotionally abusing me. I don't want him to go to prison for that, but he needs something so that we can have a, a healthier lifestyle together. I just don't feel that that space is available in, in most of the countries in our region right now. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and you, you mentioned financial or economic abuse, which is something that I think a lot of times when we talk about gender-based violence, it sort of gets glossed over. It's thrown in there. Like it could be physical, sexual, financial. And nobody really talks about it. Um, and I think the assumption is often that the maybe the woman is a housewife or she makes significantly less money than a man in a heterosexual, heteronormative relationship. But we've actually heard stories from women who make more money or the same amount or not that much less, but their money was still controlled. Like they had to hand that money over. Um, so just to expand the way that people are probably thinking about financial and economic violence because of the way that it's been talked about and the way that it's often just not talked about and just glossed over. Um, and I like that you brought up that example of um, healthcare and centering the patient because it gives me an opportunity to plug another session that we have coming up that will be with Melissa Major. <laughs> who is um, so many things, a health coach, um, a, a cancer survivor who is now doing patient navigation. So she's going to come and talk about what it looks like to move through the health system here in the Bahamas, particularly with a diagnosis like cancer and trying to access treatment and how important it is to have an advocate, someone who knows the system to help you to move through it and to focus on some of those things like bringing the documents and getting the prescriptions so that the patient can focus on healing. Um, about, you know, focus on on getting well. And that is an expanded look at gender-based violence, the way that gender-based violence is structural, the way that um, our systems like health systems, education systems marginalize and increase the vulnerability of women in many cases, just putting that out there. Um, but let's get more into the data and how you went about it. How What was the methodology like for collecting data on domestic violence, you're laughing, domestic violence and intimate partner violence. So, you know, it's, it's such a hard topic in general. It's really hard to get people to share their stories. Um, so I'm, how did you do it? So I shouldn't have laughed, but um, the, the way, 
you'll see a little bit why I laugh. So this project kicked off in January 2020, which was two key months before this little global pandemic came in of COVID-19. It's a little uh, bit of a problem. Yeah. So while many countries, especially countries that are not high income countries, do their gender-based violence prevalence uh, data collection only as face-to-face, which clearly was not going to be able to happen during COVID. I had nightmares. I mean, we went back and forth over this, but I literally had nightmares about interviewers flying into our smaller family islands, health, seemingly healthy at the time with a COVID negative test, which we know did not necessarily mean you were COVID negative. And then they would be the bringers of COVID to, you know, rum key or something. It, 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 again, as a, as a public health person as well, I was like, no, we cannot do that. So we looked around a lot to see what, what the options were for doing not face-to-face interviews with individuals. And we went through a lot of options. Um, I'll just know that certain countries like the United States uh, have been doing all of their gender-based violence prevalence studies over the phone for over a decade, right? It's just, if you've got good phone access, if you're a higher income country, it's sort of used a lot. Um, The Bahamas is in that interesting intersection that obviously... Technically, we're considered a high income country, but we all know in reality that's just because certain, well, most of us feel that this is because we have some skews. But what we do have, which are the key things, is relatively good access to phones. And that was one of the the key factors for us in making a decision to, to do a phone based survey. The other aspect that came in is that because of COVID and the very unfortunate, harsh reality that was quickly recognized that gender-based violence from intimate partner violence in particular was rising all around the world. Call centers were going off the hook because people were stuck at home and were not able to leave. There was mental health stresses. Children had significantly more time at home um, with the adults in their lives than they'd ever had before um, due to now being homeschooled by requirements in many countries. Um, But as a result, a lot of innovative methodologies had started on how to collect this extra data on what this increase in in what was likely increased violence against women and girls. Um, So UN Women was doing a lot of work on it. WHO is doing a lot of work on it. And we actually, as the Bahamas, knowing that we were going to be doing this survey, were invited to Geneva um, by the World Health Organization to be a part of a, a really phenomenal group of researchers and policymakers who were looking at what would be the ethical guidelines for conducting this incredibly sensitive research but now using the phone, like what are the implications for it? What are the additional things that need to be done? So I'll just say for us in the Bahamas, we ended up doing three rounds of of interviewer training. Um, They encompassed everything from traditional things that you would do for any survey about sort of how to introduce yourself um, as an interviewer to a whole range of very specific things. So Every interview um, started with ensuring that the woman was by herself. The last thing you need to be doing is asking a woman if her husband has ever abused her when he is uh, in the room next door. That's just not going to work. Um, Every woman was asked to provide the interviewer with a safe word so that she could just say, my dog walked in and dog was the safe word. And then the interviewer knew to start asking her questions that were the generic ones about like, and what construction is your roof made out of the typical interviewer style questions. But a lot also was done on how do you do non-visual pickups of stress? So we could ask the woman if she was by herself, but if you're in a truly abusive relationship, 
you could have a guy, literally, you have a man standing right here behind me saying, like, make sure you're telling them that you're by yourself. I want to hear what's going on because this is unfortunately in the truly controlling relationships, this is what goes on. So there was a lot of training um, on, on what are these, these non-visual cues that you'd be able to pick up on. And I feel that at the end, we, we had a really incredible group of, of interviewers. They were really just remarkable women who listened to the stories. We did a partnership with the Bahamas Psychological Association so that any of our interviewers, if they were feeling overwhelmed with the stories of abuse that they'd heard, they could call up and they could get services for themselves. Um, obviously the, the key things that would be a part of anything, but the confidentiality and the anonymity of everything were stressed again and again. Um, all women who were interviewers were given new SIM cards. So without any name attached to the SIM card, just in case, again, it was a controlling man that did happen to hear something. It's not like they could go and track down who the person was that was calling them. There is so much more that goes into this. And it's one of the, even though we did ours phone-based, it really is better done in person. I would say, or I don't want to say better, but it is, there's a lot more lessons learned in doing it in person than there are in doing it in the phone. Um, that being said, in terms of representation for an archipelago like ours, we got responses back from across 22 islands, we would not have been able to do that. It would have been a choose an island, go, you know, choose maybe three family islands, do Grand Bahama, do New Providence and three others. So we got better representation by doing it phone based. Um, but one of the concerns I would say that I have about moving forward, not just in the Bahamas, but in general is some countries are trying to do these add-ons where they're doing a general survey, much like a demographic health survey or a census or something like that. And hey, let's just add on a couple questions because we want to know what our gender-based violence prevalence data is like. No, 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 no. You cannot add these super sensitive um, aspects into a regular survey. Also, all of our respondents, whether they reported having any violence of any type, or they said, nope, I'd, I've never even had emotional violence or anything else. Um, still at the end, all of them were given the numbers for the Bahamas Crisis Center and how to reach out to the police if they do know anybody who might want to report something. Um, it's social services numbers. So contacts were provided to, to all of our respondents as well. Um, and that's just, again, not something that you can easily add on if you're trying to do a three minute let's pop this little component into another survey. I'm, I'm quite adamant about it. Sorry. So that's my, my spiel about that. Sorry. Alicia. So you said that this all got started in 2020 and then we know the pandemic happened and, and then there was a switch to using the phone. So when did it actually take place? When did, when uh, did the data collection happen? End of July, 2022. So it took us two and a half okay years to get to actually collecting the data um and it you know what it was the right move and even though at that point some of the COVID things had been relaxed um it was still there was a reason why the census ended up being delayed and they still started the census doing it also as a phone-based survey so the census this round I don't want to call it this year was done as a mix of in-person and and his phone and for a variety of reasons, I think that by waiting the the time, we did we did the best job that was possible for for us in the Bahamas. Mm -hmm. and, and then it finished November, so that was the data collection period. Just to be clear, so um, it wasn't until twenty twenty. We then did the key informant interviews and focus group discussions November through December, and so. It wasn't until 2023. Yeah. yeah. So it wasn't until 2023 that the government uh, was able to receive any data, et cetera. It was a long, long project. Okay. And what was the, so it was by phone. What was the interview like? Oh, yeah. It's got a lot of components. Um, and this is because it is 
What we've used in CARICOM is the basis is the WHO questionnaire, which has then got tweaked for the region. And then we tweaked it very specifically for the context of the Bahamas. So without trying to bore everybody with super methodological stuff, essentially what we would do first is when we had these randomized, we had a list of over a hundred thousand phone numbers. Um, they, the only thing we knew is which island they were on and then sort of were randomized out. Um, when we called, essentially one of the first things we had to find out was, was there a woman living there um, in the correct age group? Um, so it, if you had a, only had a 15 year old girl there, you weren't eligible. If you only had a 70 year old woman living there, you weren't eligible. If you were a single guy, you weren't eligible. So first, is there an eligible woman? Once it was found out if there was an eligible woman, then the next aspect was finding out if that woman wanted to participate. And it's it's a it's a long informed consent form because you need to go over these various aspects from are you prepared? Or you, you know, do you have 30 to 45 minutes that you're going to be by yourself? Da da da. This is going to raise sensitive issues. Are you prepared for that? If they say yes, then you're able to get into the components of the survey. And then we do collect a lot of data. Um, we collect, we try to cut it down as much as possible. In most countries, the interview is between 45 minutes to 60 minutes. We really cut it down to be on average, I think it ended up being say 28 minutes or something like that. Because it's phone-based, you just can't go on and on and on with these surveys. So some of them, of course, did go long. Unfortunately, if a woman had lots of things to discuss, then, then it would go on longer. Um, but once we got into the nitty gritty of what the, the survey was about, we sort of asked her her basic information information about our household, how many people live there, you know, some basic stuff that we could get as a proxy indicator of income. They're not great, but a, a good proxy for income is simply looking at how many rooms are used for sleeping in a household and how many people sleep there. So if you have five bedrooms and there's only two of you, <laughs> you're probably wealthier than the household that only has one bedroom and has five people sleeping there. That's just the way it goes. So that was our proxy indicator to be looking at things related to, to economic status. And then we would ask though about her reproductive health. Did she have children? If she did have children, we asked questions about the children. Um, after that, we would move on to information about was she partnered or not? And if she wasn't partnered, had she ever been partnered? Um, because a lot of our questions are only relevant if you've had a partner. If not, then we just jump to a section which is asking about non-intimate partner violence. Um, but after the after finding out about some stuff about that, we also asked about their attitudes. And I think this is a really interesting um, part. Um, so one is the actual violence and what that all comes down to. But another aspect is what do Bahamian women or women living as residents in the Bahamas think about gender roles, gender norms, about normalization of violence? Um, is it ever okay for a partner to physically hit his partner? Is there any time that you think that that is okay? And it tells you a lot about, and the questions are a lot more nuanced than that, but it's really interesting um, to sort of look at, at those components. And there's obviously generally a correlation that women who do normalize violence and have those attitudes are more likely to report violence. Um, unfortunately, that is, that's the global literature. Then we look at questions about the woman and her partner to really see if there have been any of these either economic, emotional, sexual, or physical intimate partner violence. If she has reported physical violence, then we a, a, a hard aspect of this survey is asking about injuries. Um, and like, how were you injured? Is it considered severe? They, I mean, it's, it's, it, you really get into the, the deep and the dark in this. Um, and un partially it's due to the bias of the women that are going to report that there was physical violence. So you might not even remember 
you know, that five years ago, somebody shoved you and, you know, in a way it led to that. So in a way there is a bias, but generally what you see is that the women who do report do report, report severe. And this is severe burning, stabbing, being beaten, need like in just bad, bad, bad ways. Um, and then we get into impact and coping strategies. So in the Bahamas, we actually asked a lot more questions on this. Um, we added to it because of wanting to create the comprehensive care model. So what happened? Did you report? If you did report, who did you report to? What happened when you reported? What was your, uh, I don't think the term was actually satisfaction, but it's along the lines of like, what was your feeling about the process that you went through? Um, and this was another opportunity for women to give us comments because now you're down to a small sample size. You're getting down to the women who both reported having either physical or sexual violence who did report that violence and then are willing to discuss this. So you do get um, very in-depth comments often at this point from the women. Then we get into another really hard section. Um, I mean, they're all hard sections, but this section, which is called other experiences, which is talking about all forms of violence. So not just from your intimate partner, which are what the previous ones focused on. And these other experiences include child sexual abuse. Um, and so it's a, it's a tough one, but the international literature really shows, you know, just like there's a cycle for poverty and it's really difficult to get out of it. There is a cycle for sexual and physical violence against women and girls. So if your partner was abused as a child, if his parents beat him, unfortunately, the likelihood is higher that he will beat his partner. If your partner's wife, with mother, was beaten in front of him when he was a child, so his dad beat his mom, he is more likely to have normalized this sense of violence and then bring that forward. So a lot of this is looking at um, what, were, what were the woman's... Um, sort of childhood sexual uh, abuse experience or other types of abuse and also what had happened to their partner if they knew. Now, a lot of the time women say, I don't know, but sometimes, unfortunately, they really do know uh, or not. It's not unfortunate that they know, but the fact that they know is because it's been a tough experience for their partner, which is again, why, well, again, not in any way trying to protect the male perpetrators, but it really does point to generally internationally that a proportion of these male perpetrators have their own childhood traumas that if we're not going to be putting them in some sort of service that is going to assist them in dealing with that, as you said, they can come out of jail and they're likely to go back to doing exactly the same thing just because they won't have seen anything to, to, to change that. Um, so those are the components. Um, and then again, at the end of the interview, the woman is always provided with additional information on how she can seek services, whether it's mental health, physical health, um, or the court system and what the, the processes are. You mentioned trauma and what we were really talking about is intergenerational trauma and, and the way that that feeds into gender-based violence. So another event plug, <laughs> we have a session on Tuesday, December 5th with Jessica Russell, a therapist based in Grand Bahama, Carla Moore, a life coach, and also lecturer at UE in Jamaica, and Helen Clinaris, who is um, a Reiki practitioner and, and healing practitioner and in, in some other modalities as well. So that should be a really interesting conversation. Folks who are interested, definitely um, register for that. The link is tiny.cc slash 16 days 23 G. Um, also, Itoal, you talked about all these different components of this interview, and I'm trying to imagine being a person who has experienced intimate partner violence or domestic violence, being asked all these questions on the phone by a stranger for 20, 30, maybe 40 minutes. Did people really stick with the interview the whole time? Was there a significant drop-off rate? Like, what did that look like? No, they did. So what was without giving like numbers out what was 
I don't know, disheartening slash moving about this was the proportion of women who said that this was the, I can't give you the proportion, um, but there was, there was a, a sizable chunk of women for whom this was the first time they'd ever shared their story. It was the first time that they were able to be acknowledged um, of having endured whatever it was that they endured. And it was, again, my gut instinct is exactly what you sort of were implying there, right? Like, you're asking me what? No, hang up. Rare, rare to, I mean, I'm going to say less than five instances that we didn't complete the calls. Once women were sharing their stories, um, they wanted to share that that is definitely how it came out it was not not what my go to would have been for this um and there was something i i know i like data so i shouldn't say this because i don't have any data to back it up at this particular point but i do wonder if the reason why the united states is doing the phone based um prevalence surveys is because people are it's easier in some ways to say these things when you're not with a per like you're like this black box on the other side of my little cell phone and I can say these things to you and it's it's different right than saying that when I am talking to Alicia and you're right there in my face and I'm like nope I'm not sharing this with this person um and again, I will say our interviewers were really, really well trained. Um, they went through so much. The other aspect I didn't bring up about the training was sensitivity training, though. So sorry, I should have included that giant component about what 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 are these key things you have to be sensitive about? And I'll also say, like, we were harsh. So we started with a giant pool of potential interviewers and that called down. I think we ended up with 30. 30% maybe of the initial group that started with the first training were our key interviewers at the end, because you had to be able to, to truly demonstrate that if a woman was starting this, that it wasn't going to be now that if your child, I'm the interviewer, if my child in the room next door is like, Mommy, like, no, you, you got to have somebody there that's going to be dealing with your child when they're hungry. You need to give yourself 100% to the woman that you're talking to. And I think the respondents felt that. I think they knew that that it was a safe space, that it was anonymous. Um, and yeah, they it was not what I would have guessed. We had a very high completion rate once the interview started. I don't think people would, would guess that. And I do wonder if it was in person, if as many people would have started much less completed the interview because then you're looking at someone and this is someone you're probably going to pass in super value picking up rice you know because of the size of our population and our our communities in in new providence judge the smaller spaces of of the family islands and in settlements so really interesting really interesting to think about the the pros and cons of telephone versus in person um and then in person you also run the risk of somebody showing up at well, the house, is, you're doing it door so to door, in, right? In two of, I know at least in two of our regional countries, there was a there was a problem because of partners coming back while an interview was going on, and both interviewer safety being put to the test as well as the respondent safety. Um, but the point about the small islands, like exactly. So maybe in New Providence, we could get away with it, but there's, you know, I was really brought this up for the Geneva folks. I was like, you guys are thinking about European and South American and Southeast Asian and African countries. You are not thinking about the Caribbean and the Pacific islands where we have populations. Like, can you imagine doing this in St. Vincent and the Grenadines or in St. Kitts and Nevis where we're small enough, but if your total population is less than a hundred thousand, and then you've got people, it's just like being in Acklands or being in Cat Island or wherever, you know, like once you get into less than 5,000 people, also the minute an interviewer arrives on the island, who's this gal? Where's she coming from? What's she doing? And then she goes and she's done on day one. Maybe she does some interviews in my head. The word is going to get out 
that then this is going on and it quite then it's sort of anonymity might not be quite as tight again i'm not saying that there aren't mechanisms that could be done to ensure anonymity if it was done person in person um but i think that covid allowed the bahamas to truly show an example of very high quality research being done using a mechanism that is typically only used in the high income developed countries like the United States, right? Like, I think we we did a really good job here. Yeah, and for folks that might not know the, the Bahamian context, we, our entire population is under 400,000 people. And we have islands that have maybe 1,800 people. And the island, knowing that someone arrived is a very real thing. I experienced this myself in islands that I've never been to before, where I introduced myself to someone and they say, oh yeah, I knew that a such and such um, landed yesterday. Oh, it was you. Um, very real thing that happens in the islands, not an exaggeration at all. Uh, so who, who ended up completing the survey? Like who, who were the women? What were the. So, Demo yeah, so we had, um, like I said, I mean, for me, one of the, the exciting aspects of doing the, the survey in this way, using the phone was that we were able to, to cover so many islands. So 45% of the population, um, I, I I can give like these types of stats, uh, the respondents were from New Providence, but that's only 45%, right? So we did get 55% um, from Grand Bahama and our family islands. Um, we did, so in other countries in the region, I should point this out, their age group was women 15 to 64 in the Bahamas. We were limited to 18 to 64. And this was again to protect the safety of the respondents. In the Bahamas, we have something that's called essentially a duty to report. So if any minor tells you that they are being abused, you have a legal duty to report this. Um, and while the intention is a good intention, what all the experts told me, and I am not a gender-based violence expert at all in terms of what the dynamics are of this, but what um, we were cautioned on was that if that meant that then somebody was going to show up at this household um, and say to whatever the male was there that we understand that you're abusing your 16 year old daughter, that that actually can put her in tremendously more danger if than if she is the one that elects to. I don't, again, this is not my area. So all I know is that we were warned, don't do that. Um, so we limited ours to the 18 to 64 year old range. Um, so yeah, so that was it. Um, our demographics ended up being really similar to most of those in the region in terms of like the average age and those types of things. There, there wasn't a whole lot of um, surprises in, in how that came out. Most of the women um, were either currently partnered or had a partner in the past. All of the things that, that you would expect. The correlation for those who had never had a partner were younger women. All of the, the typical things. And I know you keep, um, you reference the data and, and saying that you can't say any numbers. Um, can you tell us what's going on? Well, it's, you know, things are underway. Um, it, you know, it is, it's new data. It's big data. Like I, I, I think it took me 20 minutes just to explain what the different components of the survey are, right? Like there is, there is so much to be gone through. Um, and my understanding, knowing that this is now not, not, not my data, this belongs to the government of the Bahamas. Um, but my understanding is certain agencies in particular, like the office of the wife of the prime minister, from what I understand is very, very, very interested in being able to um, move forward with this social services, 100% um, will be involved, but this is the whole point of this is to make it multi-agency. So I think that might be part of the, the coordination of how does this move forward. So one of the recommendations would have been for being able to create the comprehensive care model, which is, should be a coordinated care model, is everybody who might be interacting 
needs to understand aspects of the data and what it means for them and their policies, whether it's the defense force who are often going to be the individuals that after an emergency, so Hurricane Dorian, the defense force guys are going to be there on the ground. Like, what? Just because it's an emergency does not mean that gender-based violence goes away. In fact, it can be increased. It often is increased in humanitarian crises. So how do we bring the defense force to the table? In addition to NEMA and social services and um, the Ministry of Education and the Ministry of Health and the police and the attorney general's office and all of those things, it's. I think it's just something that they're working through. Um, and I am very hopeful, though, that, that we'll be able to, to see meaningful action in the Bahamas as a result. So we don't have a timeline for when this data might be available or when this model might be. Started. I don't. I am. I, <laughs> I don't have uh, the timeline. Um, but I am sure that you guys will be able to post on your websites and in all of that as soon as data is being made available, um, even in summary form. I mean, again, the more people who are educated and aware, the the better. Yeah. And and what can you say about the data from the other countries that have done there are five other countries in the region that have yeah. Um so I'd say one of the things that I think um, is interesting about the regional data is that for some things, um, for example, physical violence, this is something that for most of the countries, it is so on par with exactly what would be expected is reported internationally. So this sort of 25 to 30 percent of women um, have ev have reported ever um, having some form of physical abuse. And yes, that is one out of four, or one out of three. So if it's not you and it's not the person sitting next to you, it means it's the person sitting across from you probably has experienced physical violence. So this that's what the data um, showed for the physical violence um, from trying to think that's Jamaica, Grenada, and Suriname. Um, Guyana reported the highest. They reported 35%. Um, and I'm not sure if that's something to weigh the, the actual survey was done or if it's just simply that they really are potentially um, having more. Again, timing is super important because if you do do this type of survey right after there's been an earthquake, uh, any other major thing, conflict, those types of things, you're going to see a bump. So I am, I don't know what natural disaster might have recently occurred in Guyana at that point. Um, there might not have been, it might just be higher. Um, sexual re ever reported sexual violence always lower um, than physical. Again, we saw that Guyana had the highest um, with 14% of women who were in the survey reporting that they'd ever um, encountered sexual violence. Um, but for the most part, it, it's again in sort of these international areas of the 10 to 15%, which is where that often comes in. I think in some of the Western European countries and maybe America, it's a little bit lower. It's more like the eight to 10%. Uh, I don't have it off the top of my head. And if anybody in the group who's there does know that number, um, please feel free. And then emotional violence, psychological violence, as always high across the region. Guyana, again, doing high though, 40% um, in Guyana, but not low anywhere else. Suriname was 35%, Jamaica was 30%. Um, I don't know why I don't have the numbers for Trinidad right here in front of me. I'm sorry, but um, they did also do the project. In Grenada, it was interesting. They had very low reporting um, for the emotional violence, but I think they actually used a different measure there. So there's different components that can come into the psychological violence. So I, I, my guess would be that because the other countries were all fairly similar. But that again is that well over one in three women regionally are required reporting psychological violence from their intimate partner, because that's the only one this is looking at. So this isn't even that you being yelled at in some other way or had any of the other things. It's not just yelling. That is not the only form of emotional violence. I don't want to limit it to that. I wonder, I mean, we know that all of these statistics are 
lower than the reality because it depends on reporting and it depends on people's perception of what's happening to them. How were the questions phrased? Like, are people being asked if they've experienced rape or sexual violence or is it being given to them in terms that might give a better understanding of what the word or the term means than the way that we generally understand it. Because there are so many people who find out, who realize later in life that, oh, that was rape. That thing that happened. To Such me. a good question. So yeah, no, uh, the word rape does not appear in the questionnaire um, specifically for that reason. Because if you ask women, have you been raped in there for, let me not say everybody, but for many women, this concept of what rape is, is that a stranger primarily is if you are just going to ask a woman like what is rape they're what they're just going to come up with generally involves a stranger so if i am asking a woman a question about their intimate partner and i use the word rape no but if you frame questions very being very specific about the actual act was there a time where your partner forced you to have sexual intercourse with out you wanting to people will say yes to that and if you ask them has your intimate partner ever raped you they'll say no and the two do not come together and then there were iterations of what it wasn't just vaginal penetration there was this there was that there was the whole litany of of various things that that can occur within sexual violence because it's true as soon as you label it if your label doesn't fit my definition it's we're just not going to get answers that are that are in tune with what we're trying to actually look at measuring. Yeah. And did you see a relationship between um, respondents attitudes toward violence? Um, I guess stereotyping was in there, too, and their experiences of um, domestic and intimate partner violence. Yeah. And this is a, I mean, Again, I'm not, I, I'm not even going to be able to bring up because I don't remember them, to be honest, what, what it would be in the Bahamas. Um, but this is just, it's a global phenomenon that played out in every single one of the regional countries where I remember when we were doing the research for this, I was like, oh, yep. So, and it's interesting, the ones that come out, right? It also depends on how you phrase them. So there's, there is a question that doesn't really have a connection uh which essentially understandably for the context of the bahamas asked about whether i'm god i can't remember the exact words but it's essentially is along the lines of is the man the ho- head of the household um based on god's desire it's it's along those lines that it really frames that in this religious um context and almost all women in the region say yes look because of our religious norms there's no correlation between that though because again 90 not 90 i don't know what it is but a very large majority of women will say yes to that because it's from that side but when you get into the nitty gritties of is it okay for a man to hit his wife because she burnt his dinner if she says yes to that i can fairly confidently say that there's going to be some sort of correlation because it just, it does mean that if you think that that is all right, that there's a good chance that it's within your life as well, unfortunately. And no, there's no ability to often tease out these chicken and egg things. I think that's the other thing that has to be made explicit when discussing these things is, is it that you have these attitudes because from a child you've experienced abuse and if you've experienced abuse as a child you're also more likely to experience abuse as an adult and therefore you have those attitudes or do you you know it's just like or are you experiencing are you are you in a relationship where this abuse is being perpetrated on you and that has accentuated these beliefs that perhaps came from your childhood as well so it's it's so difficult. I mean, there's a huge link as well, right? Between alcohol and drug abuse and, and gender-based violence. This is again from the international literature and within the region as well. So 
women who report much more frequent drinking or report other types of drug abuse much more likely to report having violence in their lives. Again, are they drinking because they have intimate partner violence and they're drinking to self-medicate or does drinking leave them even more vulnerable because now their guard is down um, with their partner and maybe they've passed out. And I mean, I hope everybody knows the cup of tea uh, sort of little vignette that's out there, but you know, it's really good where the guy is like, does she want a cup of tea? Huh. If she's passed out, she does not want a cup of tea. There you go, right? And but unfortunately, if you are passed out, your ability um, to protect yourself is is done away with. So, but no chicken and egg. We cannot say that X leads to Y or Y leads to X. Yeah, and also to be clear, like we're not talking about causation or like pathologizing women who experience um, nope. domestic or intimate partner violence yeah. or any form of gender based violence. The question is really about um, the the relationship between these ideas and the things that we are taught and that maybe we don't get to unlearn before experiencing them or experiencing the manifestation of them. Exactly. And it's um, just this, that it's a correlation. It is, you cannot say that X leads to Y or, or Y leads to X, um, but they are correlated. Yeah. Or that somebody caused their own experience of oh, violence because of their belief or, or anything like that. Yeah. Just to be clear, this is not a, victim blaming situation here do i i mean i could i feel like we could go on for another hour but we shouldn't oh, we shouldn't <laughs> because these four people are are already here 20 minutes longer than they probably expected <laughs> any does anyone have any any questions or comments or anything that you want to share i see there's one in the chat i think this might have gotten answered but just in case the question is will there be access to the data for the layperson that would be my that would be my hope. Um, it's something that I brought up with no, not even to do with the Bahamas. It's something I brought up uh, to WHO when I was there in Geneva because just the region is infamous for this. This isn't a Bahamas thing. This is this is a Caribbean island thing. Um, oftentimes these international databases that you can go on the WHO site and you can go look across so many countries and, and download their data. And it's just so rare. Um, and I know at that time that they were working with one of the other countries in the region to be able to get their data sets um, and make it available publicly. I have not followed up um, to see if that happens, but I do think that if once some of the data gets on uh, available for for laypersons, obviously strictly anonymized. I mean, it's it's already strictly anonymized, but even more anonymized. So what we would do, um, so the government and sort of the higher level folks would have received data that had at least island groupings together, as long as there was enough. So I probably put Michael together, and I would have done some things like that. We'd maybe even remove it though at that grouping level and just leave it if we made it, if there, if not if we, if the government made it publicly available um, through some international agency, my guess is that it would come out as New Providence, Grand Bahama, and other island. Um, just because, again, if you, we did things like not ask specific ages, we only have age groupings. Um, so we tried to make it as difficult as possible, but I'd still for caution probably remove a few more of the the bits. But other than that, I hope yes. Any other questions? You know, sometimes it takes a while to be able to articulate the question. So this is me stalling to see if anyone wants to think through their question, type it into the chat. <laughs> Don't lose this opportunity. <laughs> While people are thinking, I guess, I will talk a little bit about some of the events that we have coming up. So I already mentioned the session with Jessica Russell, Carla Moore, and Helen Clonaris that will be happening on Tuesday, December 5th at 6 p.m. And that is focused on 
trauma and how to work through trauma and move toward healing. And you can register for that at tiny.cc slash 16 days 23 D. That's on Tuesday. We will also have a conversation with Megan Walker, who is the vice chair of the London Police Services Board in Canada. And she has been advocating for the Canadian Criminal Code to define femicide. And she has actually worked with, some of you might remember, we had a session last year with Myrna Dawson from the Canadian Femicide Observatory. So the two of them have worked together quite a bit. And looking forward to hearing the perspective from Megan Walker and the work that she's been doing um, on this, this police board. That is happening on Wednesday, December 6th at 6 p.m. And you can register for that at tiny.cc slash 16 days 23 E. We also have two postponed events because technical glitch and also just life lifing. <laughs> so hopefully we'll have dates soon, but we're going to have that session with Melissa Major about patient navigation um, focused on the healthcare system at some point next week. And then we also will be rescheduling a session with Chrissy Blows from Cape Town, South Africa. Really interested in this conversation with her. She is a human rights lawyer at a law firm that is a nonprofit. And this is a norm in South Africa. So she'll talk about the work that, that she does. I'm offering pro bono services through this law firm and also the National Human Rights Institute in South Africa, which sounds like it's functioning while the Bahamas still doesn't have one. So that'll be an interesting conversation. Look out for the, the date and the time to be announced for that. Um, Etoile has put her email address in the chat. So for those on Facebook or watching the recording, it's, can I say it? <laughs> epinder at sannyjess.com. epinder at S-A-N-I-G-E-S-T dot com. If you have questions about the data collection, about doing research on gender-based violence in the Bahamas in a small place, um, questions somewhere around this area, you can get in touch with it all. Will there be sessions to teach Yeah, looking at the last question. Who's the data? You know, if they release it, I would be delighted to. You know, I, one of the great things with the, the world now is now there's R. So if anybody knows R, uses R, but it's sort of before you had to spend thousands of dollars to have Stata or SPSS or any of those things, but R really makes things easy. Um, and also makes data visualizations fun. You lots of different ways that we can do things these days. Um, so you're not just stuck in the stiff old uh, previous statistical softwares of the, of the 1990s, I guess, or the 2000s, but yeah. Happy to do anything along those lines. Awesome. All right, giving people another chance to come up with questions. Another event to plug. <laughs> also very exciting. Sunday, December 10th, which is Human Rights Day. We will have a conversation with Palestine Dwakat, who is a Palestinian woman and advocate. And we will be talking about Palestine, taking it from 1948 to now. Um, sharing some history, some of the current context, and getting an understanding of what is needed to build true global solidarity, why that's important. Um, and Equality Bahamas will be doing some work in the weeks to come on building that global solidarity and also building the capacity to care. This is something that we're really interested in right now, the way that we're sort of all in our bubbles and feel like we, we don't have the time, we don't have the energy to care about anything else. Um, so understanding the connection between our struggles, especially as we think about colonialism and genocide, because guess who else, guess what other place has a history of that and is still experiencing the impact of colonization and other connected issues and just getting past that feeling of we're too far away, what can we do? And talking about some real things that we can do. So that is happening on Sunday, December 10th. That is going to be at 3 p.m. Nassau time. And you can register at tiny.cc slash 16 days 23 G. And for the full lineup of events, I'll put this in the chat as well. Tiny.cc slash 16 days 23. You'll see the lineup and then you'll see 
those sessions that I talked about that are going to be rescheduled, we'll get that sorted in the next day or two and put those into that document as well. All right, last call. Any questions, any comments, anything? I have a question. What was the letter for the one that is going to be led with the doctor talking about cancer care and sort of the the patient advocacy and all of those things? That's one that we need to reschedule, but it's oh, going okay. to be most likely a Facebook live. So it'll just be watching the live on our Facebook. Okay. Perfect. Yeah. Okay, it looks like we gave people a lot to think about and maybe we will get some emails later with questions. I think people probably really wanna get into that data. So hopefully that will be made available soon and we'll start to see a comprehensive slash coordinated care model coming together. And if people are interested, there are examples out there. There are countries that are doing this. Um, Antigua and, and Barbuda is an example of having this sort of one-stop service where you can go to the Department of Gender and Family Affairs. They've got an examination room in there if you need a rape kit or anything like that. They have a social worker there. They have a space there for um, if you have to, if you have a court date you don't have to go to the court because they have a room that's set up with cameras they can like zoom you in to the court so you don't have to face the perpetrator um just really great work they've been doing that that's not new that's been around for a while and when I first saw it I was like oh my god they need this so bad um so that's the reason that I'm really excited about this research that Sani Jess has done at all and really just waiting 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 for it to be announced and for us to see it and be able to use it because we need it so badly. Um, there's, you know, the hashtag for the um, the UN Women part of the campaign is no excuse. Um, and you know, Equality Bahamas is saying the time is now. Like the time was actually a long time ago, but the next best time is is now to take action on this. So thank you for your work on this. Thank you for talking with us about it. Thank you everyone who attended. We will look out for your questions if you have some later on and we hope to see you at um, some of the upcoming events over the next week and a half. And of course, all the rest of the year and into and throughout 2024 because it's 16 days of a campaign, but we do this work 24 seven, 365. Thanks everybody and have a good night. Thanks, Elisa.